Good evening and welcome to yet another episode of South African of the Year Daily Show here on ANN7, the show where we go into the lives of extraordinary and incredible South Africans doing wonderful things around the country, this time through the lens of the reflection and progression of their lives. In studio today, we are talking about the charismatic Southern Ground Hornbill. A lot of you may know it quite well, but we're speaking to an expert and a passionate person who is the brainchild and founder of the Mabula Ground Horn Bill Project, Lucy Kemp. Lucy, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. Uh, we always want to get right to the beginning and where it sort of all started, but we'd love to know what uh, Lucy Kemp was like growing up, because obviously it all stems from somewhere. Uh, probably. Uh, my dad did all the early research on the species in Kruger, so for me growing up it was term time was at school in Pretoria and just about every holiday was in Kruger National Park. So I think I had a charmed childhood out in the bush, out of the tourist camps um, and learning to love wild places I think. Where did you grow up and what were those adventures like, sort of just being innocent and um, venturing into areas you probably didn't even know very well but you felt like you were a part of? Absolutely. I mean, I think Kruger Park having all that wild space as a child to adventure in, and in those days the, the red tape was a lot less than it is now, um, and just being basically allowed free in that space, learning how to drive a 4x4 at the age of 10 in case Dad fell out of a tree and couldn't get us back to camp, um, and then him abusing it so he could jog along the road next to me to get his exercise, and then a lot of travel. Um, my dad went to a lot of conferences around the world, and they always made an effort to take us with, and that's definitely instilled a a need for adventure and a need for travel in me. Did you have a lot of siblings or were you a bit of a Mowgli that would um, <laughs> spend a lot of time with the animals and you would just <laughs> saunter through the, the, the wild with them? No, I definitely had parents and I, had a, I have a brother um, who's also kind of gone into the same line of work as well. So. And that's obviously where your love for wildlife began? Absolutely, absolutely. Now the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, mm. tell us about that. Okay, so I, this project was founded in 1999 um, by a passionate British woman called Anne Turner. Um, she arrived uh, in South Africa to retire into the bush, actually, and she went to Mgeni River Bird Park and she met a ground hornbill there. Um, basically, she fell totally in love with this bird, those long eyelashes, charismatic big, um, and she went back to Mabula and started asking around, why aren't there ground hornbills in this area? It's good savannah, it's good bush, why no ground hornbills? And that's when she got in touch with my dad, and he at the time was looking for reserves to reintroduce ground hornbills onto, to try and figure out how we do that, and so the project was born. Well, we managed to get a chance to uh, sort of follow you around working on this project, so let's take a look at what the project is all about. Hi, welcome. I'm Lucy Kemp, the project manager for the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Welcome to the site. Let's go. For us, the important thing with this bird and conserving this bird is, yes, it's ecologically important. It's a top order predator. It's a big bird. It's very much an icon of the African savannas, but also it's extremely culturally important to, to not only South Africans, but throughout the range right up to southern Kenya. So this guy was harvested from the Timbavati Klaseri area um, in Limpopo. Um, and yeah, you know, he, he was a two day old chick when he was taken from the nest. He was reared in a captive situation, um, but now he's a perfectly wild functioning ground hornbill. So if you have a look up at the artificial nest, you can see our alpha male storm at the nest and what he's carrying in his bill is a big pile of leaf lining. And what he's doing is he collects this so that he can bring leaf litter so that the female has a nice soft bed of leaves to lay her eggs on. But what he does is he hides little bits of food inside that parcel and he will wait at the nest until she comes um, and then he will give it to her and then she'll uh, sort all the leaves out in the nest and then she'll look for all those little bits of food that he's hidden inside that. Ground Humbles have got into such a terrible position in South Africa, well not just South Africa, many other countries within their range, um, is they breed very slowly. Um, so they only have one chick on average about every nine years. Um, so they, they don't re reproduce very quickly. 
they lay uh, two to three eggs, usually only two, and they hatch about five or six days apart. Um, probably the biggest threat is poisoning. Uh, farmers put out poison bait for jackals and leopards and cheetah and things like that. Um, and the birds, because they will scavenge, they're walking through the bush, they find a poisoned carcass, they will eat off that. And as I said, we only need to lose four birds a year to continue to push the population into decline. Another threat that really slows the breeding down um, is the loss of nests. Ground hornbills, like all hornbills, have to nest inside a hollow. And if you think for a bird that big, it has to have a tree this big. Um, and we're kind of losing those trees in our landscape, whether they're being harvested for timber, um, elephants maybe knocking them over with you know, the increasingly violent storms that we're having. Um, the floods might be wiping out the, the riparian vegetation. And so we're losing these nest trees. And ground hornbills, when they find a nest that they like, they'll use that for decades. And we suspect they might even inherit it through the generations. So a good nest is an incredibly important thing for ground hornbills. And it's a very central part to their social structures, their whole social dynamics. You know, it, it is the center of their being, basically. This is smaller than one territory and for, for a, a territorial bird like this to try and defend that territory if they had to sort of march around the borders that they would waste too much energy so what they do is they use that call and they call in the very first light before all the other birds start calling so it's very it's, it's a, that very quiet moment of the dawn um, and that call can carry five kilometers so you know, Storm can sit in his tree and he can call and he could let any neighbours know that he's here, he's present and he's looking after his territory and then he listens to what the neighbours have to say and if the Joneses are a little bit close to that border then he might fly across and check that they're not intruding in his territory. <laughs> To try and get uh, interest in ground hornbills again, but also to try and generate funds for the project and also get income into to areas where communities are still sharing um, the land with ground hornbills, we've started a craft development initiative where we're trying to, to get people interested in ground hornbills as a cool thing, trying to make them cool, desirable, uh, yeah, just of interest. Um, so we've we've got a, an artist um, up near Hoodspray who makes these lovely beaded hornbills with the cool eyelashes. Um, and these are made um, by uh, Brian. These ground hornbills are really cool. They're made by a Zulu artist called Becky Amieni. Um, he's managed to build the second half of his home just from the sale of ground hornbills to us. So that's been really cool. Um, and then those lovely bowls. So just, yeah, trying to get ground hornbills popular. <laughs> Where did your love for birds begin? Because when you're out in the wild, it's natural to, you know, have that attraction towards the the, the big five and mm. the impala or whatever it may be, but not necessarily birds. Birds are a species that seem to be neglected a lot of the time and not really celebrated when it comes to education. I, and I probably would have neglected them too. Growing up as the child of an ornithologist, I've spent most of my life actively avoiding birds um, and somehow have found my way back to ground hornbills. I'm not sure what fate had in mind for me, but they are fantastic creatures. They're indicators of the environment and what's going on. And also, I think especially with the rural communities that we work with, it's a very easy first link to start talking about conservation. Birds are something everyone sees around them all the time. And was that just purely because of that site or um, was there a specific moment where you just thought birds are something that I need to focus on? Sure, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think conservation has always been my passion um, and I think I, in the past I worked in Namibia doing a lot of community conservation, black rhino, and then this opportunity came up. I don't think I would have chosen it, um, but it found me, I think. The hornbill species, why them and why they're also so important to keep around? All right, the southern ground hornbill is endangered in South Africa now. Um, we estimate about 2,000 2, birds left in the entire country, um, and that's from Limpopo right down to the Eastern Cape. Um, but these groups live in quite a complex social structure, and so there's actually only one breeding female in these groups. So even if you go to Kruger Park and see a group of even nine birds, there's still only one breeding female. And so what that means is in the total, there's probably only about 400 breeding females left. So if we don't put ourselves into gear quite quickly, we're going to lose the species from the landscape altogether. You speak about the importance of that and the severity of the issue and uh, mm. 
how grave it will be if we don't um, galvanize all mm. of that. Um, what have been some of the challenges getting that across? And I, I can see that you're starting, of course, from an early, early sort of primary mm. um, start of education to really educate um, the young ones about it so that, of course, the future is taken care of. But um, what are some of those challenges to get the word out there? Um, I think just capacity, having enough people on the ground, because ground hornbills live on territories, we actually have to almost visit each one of those territories. Um, but ground hornbills are culturally very important. Um, and so we're working a lot with the traditional authority councils, um, as well as with the, with the kids. Um, and there we don't find that many challenges. The birds are already inherently important to the people in those areas. Um, I would say for us the biggest challenge is working with commercial farmers, um, where there's a, a monetary aspect to the issue when the ground hornbills break windows. Um, even the most conservation-minded farmer, by the time you've replaced every single window in your house five or six times, you're going to lose interest and shoot or poison the birds. Well, I can certainly see that you're an educator on this matter and that you speak very passionate about, about it every day and that it is your duty that you've bestowed upon yourself to tell people about um, the severity and importance of the ground hornbill, the southern ground hornbill. Um, but if anyone out there is uh, just as passionate or perhaps just as interested and is loving the work that Lucy Kemp and her team is doing, at the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, then all you need to do is cast your vote by SMSing CONS, that's CONS, um, CONS6 to 43043, or you can email CONS6 to satyvoting at ANN7.com. If you can't do any of that, then you can go to the website www.ann7.com, follow the instructions, and that will take you to the, uh, the, the prompt to vote for the South African of the Year Awards in the category for Conservationist of the Year. My name is Ntabi Seng Monama and uh, I'm the environmental educator of the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Uh, what I basically do, I'm the environmental educator, so I'm in charge of all the school outreaches, all the community outreaches, or anything that involves working with people and the ground hornbills. That's my position. Everything that I know about the birds, I teach the kids, especially kids that still have the ground hornbills in their area because they know them but then they don't know the conservation status behind the ground hornbills. They don't know the importance of having those birds in their communities. This is one of the schools that I work with. Uh, I come here at least once a year to talk to the kids and teach them about the birds. They don't have, they've never actually seen a real ground hornbill but I come with um, a dummy ground hornbill and I show it to them. And for the fact that they're so close to our reintroduction site here at Mabula Game Reserve, it's very important for them to know a little bit more about the birds in case those birds decide to fly over to the nearest communities. Our relationship um, is one of uh, is uh, one which is very good because it it is not for their first time to be here. They came here last year, and it was very good for us to learn about the hornbill. And uh, we even in, uh, integrate the hornbill with the lesson that we have in the classes, like that the hornbill is a scavenger's uh, and that that eat animal uh, that eat meat. So we taught in the kids about uh, the herbivores, the carnivores, the omnivores. So it is a very interesting relationship. <laughs> I 
at I will a little more happen. I just know how little 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 one. We already saw what you're doing at some of the schools to, um, you know, educate them young. What is that uh, recruitment um, plan of these schools? How do you recruit these schools? Um, we basically try and focus on schools that are still in areas where wild ground hornbills exist. So these are the areas where we're working with the landowners and farmers to, to try and uh, mitigate all the threats that the species faces. But then in the areas where we're doing reintroductions, those are the areas that we also target the schools. These are big black scary birds, I mean they look like dinosaurs and in most of the areas where they've already become locally extinct they've been missing from the landscape for about three generations. So if something like that rocks up on your back doorstep you're going to get the fright of your life if you don't already know about the bird and why it's important that we're bringing it back. Is there a time that you've ever felt like it isn't really working um, and what were those uh, moments like where you sort of perhaps I wouldn't want to use the phrase give up because, uh, you know, it's something that's, that, that's in you. You've been mm. born into it. But times where you've just sort of felt so defeated that perhaps the project just isn't worth it. We've definitely all had moments of that, and I think one of the biggest ones for us was one of our release sites um, near Tabazimbi. Um, it was a perfect release. We'd released a group of five back into that area, and it was perfect for a year and the birds wandered off the safe area onto a neighboring property and there they found poison bait and basically that set us back easily three or four years in our work we we do learn from these things and every loss is a lesson and and does keep us going and re-motivates us but for us that was a severe blow it sounds very um idyllic and uh what's the word uh, i'd say very yeah, I think, I think really it is ideal in the sense that you can have that kind of a, a, a positive vision with it all. But when something sets you three or four years back, what really keeps you going to, to make it work? Because that, that feels like three or four years that you've lost on, really. I think I'm lucky to have a team that's completely committed to that. They're all very strong conservationists at heart. And we just have to keep trying. In conservation, it's really a crisis discipline, and there is no textbook for us. So we, we have to keep doing to keep learning. And I'm sure we'll suffer many more losses as we go forward. But I think that's for any conservation project, and it's the keeping going that's important. It's the keeping going that's important to make things work, and that's exactly what the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project and the whole team has been doing together with Lucy Kemp. Uh, they also went into the community of Bella Bella, and this is the work that they've been getting up to there. The Hornbill project um, was started here at Mabula in 1999. Um, there was a landowner here, um, Anne Turner, she was the founder of the project. Um, she was from the UK and she wanted to retire in the bush and so she bought a property here. And she went down to Mgeni Bird Park in KZN and she saw these guys in captivity. And she thought, what kind of bird is this? And, and then started thinking, well, why aren't they here? This is Savannah, why don't we have ground hornbills here? For a lot of people, conservation is a luxury. Most people are just struggling to get through the day. Um, but I think having our natural environment around us is a, is a way of healing ourselves. And if we can try and keep these places safe and keep them as natural as possible, it means that all of us have a place to come back to recharge our battery. With this bird and conserving this bird is, yes, it's ecologically important. It's a top order predator, it's a big bird. It's very much an icon of the African savannas. We've been working to harvest these chicks, so instead of leaving them to die in the nest, we've been taking them and then we've been working with a number of institutions to hand rear these chicks. We certainly would love to have some of those uh, ground hornbill 
uh, birds right now squawking in Johannesburg and in fact all across South Africa because we desperately need that rain and they refer to it as a rain bird. Absolutely and instead of squawking maybe their call is referred to as booming. It's mm. a really deep deep call. It travels about five kilometers across the savannas on a cool calm morning um, and that is what people have associated with the coming of the summer rains. Um, these guys it, it takes a huge amount of energy for them to get breeding. The whole breeding cycle is about six weeks so they're not going to commit to that unless the rains are going to be good and people have over the ages learned to time the planting of their crops and, and basically it's one of the seasonal indicators for a lot of rural communities throughout Africa. Besides the, um, the obvious features of a ground hornbill, I'm sure there must be that misconception with vultures perhaps as well. Um, what are the main differences there? Because they seem to have a lot of the same behavioral um, uh, manners in terms of how they uh, feed, as you say, mm. on, on different carcasses mm. and uh, just sort of fly in and take off with the carcasses too. So ground hornbills are termed fornivorous, which means they catch uh, live food. So they, they're hunters, basically really good hunters. Those long eyelashes, they're not really to give supermodel status. They're to protect their eyes from the sun. Um, and so you'll always encounter them as a group walking through the bush. Um, the, those black feathers really uh, make them heat sensitive. So in a changing climate like we are now and with, with uh, warming temperatures, I think they're going to struggle because they really get uh, heat sensitive, heat stressed when it gets to about 26 degrees, and then they have to move into the shade. Can they really cause any harm to humans at all or is it just not, a case of not at all. if you invade their territory perhaps the only I, time they ever approach you? But no, otherwise. I think only you know if perhaps you were trying to climb their nest tree they <laughs> might take umbrage to that um, but no they're fearful of humans um, and actually because of this long coexistence between humans and ground hornbills and the mythologies that have built up they've been a part of the human landscape in rural areas for a long time and you'll see them walking through villages in, in amongst the cows they're just part of the landscape, they, they're just there. Um, and people know them, um, but don't pay them much attention. Remember, if you want to vote for Lucy Kemp and the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project uh, for Conservationist of the Year category, all you need to do is uh, SMS CONS and the number six, that's CON6 to 43043, or you can email CON6 to satyvoting at ann7.com or go to the website www.ann7.com. And you can also win yourself double tickets to the SATI Awards and you'd get a VIP experience for you and a partner. After the break, we have some fun and games. Welcome back. We're still in studio with Lucy Kemp, a conservationist for Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, um, a project that focuses on um, conserving and preserving the species of the southern ground hornbill, which are endangered. We've spoken a lot about the seriousness of uh, everything surrounding the wild and, of course, with the focus on the ground hornbills. But now we'd like to have some fun. Being the South African of the Year Awards and you being nominated, we want to make sure that you have good knowledge of South Africa. So we played a little trivia. Oh <laughs> and it's, you're saying, oh dear, but <laughs> I take a look here and my team has been very, very kind to you. This All is right. going to be a walk in the park for I you. I hope so. <laughs> First question, true or false? Cradle of Humankind was declared a heritage site. True. Correct. What is the national bird of South Africa? The blue crane. Yeah, you have to get that one. <laughs> <laughs> From the big five, which is the biggest South African animal? Or which animal is the biggest in essay? The elephant. Who was the artist who recently passed away and he was famous for the song Nkalagata? Mendoza and my condolences. Oh, very, very sad that. And what is the third most spoken language in South Africa? Hmm. That's probably the only trick, tricky one around sure. there. Is it Zulu? I'm going to give you a second guess. No. The third most spoken language in South Africa. Hmm. 
I don't know. <laughs> you, can't, <laughs> you can't be perfect your whole life. It's Afrikaans. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So you got four to five. <laughs> you got four to five, which is uh, a great number. Great. Uh, that's uh, 90%. Now, usually when it comes to personal projects or personal life or business, whatever it may be, people commonly ask the question, what is the plan for the next five years? But seeing as uh, we're talking about the Southern Ground Hornbill, what is the plan for the next nine years? Sure. Um, I think the first next step for us is we're busy building a centralized hand rowing facility. Loskop Dam has given us a piece of land, um, so we're fundraising for that and we should break ground in August. And the intention with that is we can uh, do a much better job of rearing really wild, good, strong, good quality birds for the reintroduction program, which will allow us to do this, you know, we've sort of been in the experimental phase and now we can get out there and just really bump the population back up. You're nominated amongst uh, nominees such as African Penguin Project, Township Owl Project, Livestock Guarding Dog Project, uh, the Joburg Zoo Wild Dogs Project, uh, Ivory Anti-Poaching Project, and Valpro. Those are really uh, great causes all around. Fantastic. And this is probably one of the hardest things to, to ask a nominee, but yes. um, what, what would be your passion that would uh, make you vote for any of those but yourself. So which one would you probably lean towards voting for um, uh, out, out of your fellow nominees? <laughs> I'm going to say penguins are so cute they're going to get plenty of votes on their own um, and I think probably the plight of the vultures in, in Africa, that's a really hard thing to try and tackle from a conservation point of view. They move such huge areas, you know, at least we can work with individuals on the ground. Um, so I'd probably give my vote to Valpro. You see, you're such a professional. I can't believe this is uh, your first interview in the studio. Uh, it's been a pleasure having Thank you. You. Um, you do that so so easily, and uh, you've been a wonderful uh, guest to have on the show. Thank you very much, and good luck with that uh, PhD. You're doing some admirable work, you and your team. We saw in Tubby and how passionate mm. how passionate she is mm. about all the work and uh, how the kids are really getting involved with that. So we really do commend you guys, and it's important for for us to keep that ecological uh, balance that has been quite imbalanced for for a while and uh, it's people such as yourself and these great projects and causes to make sure that we conserve that and allows us to be able to see that for generations to come all the wildlife and uh, the important factors to what makes South Africa and Africa what it is and what makes all of us great and the people that we are in in inherently are so thank you very much for your time and um, good luck with, with with the project thank you very much and to ANN7 for just giving us the space to get a pretty weird bird out there to the public <laughs> Thank you very much. A pretty weird bird, but a very important one to look after. Remember, if you want to vote for the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, which is uh, led by conservationist Lucy Kemp, all you need to do is SMS CONS and the number 6 to 43043 or email CONS, so that's CONS, and the number 6 to Sati Voting at nn7.com or you can just go to the website www.nn7.com for more information about all of that. And your vote can even get you double tickets and a VIP experience at the South African of the Year Awards on the 25th of November. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much for watching. From myself, Mups Mopanyani, good night.